Well, as she uh, has a moment, maybe I'll just introduce the panelists right now and that way we can jump into it at the end. So one of our first panelists will be Yan Lee Marie. He's from the Surfrider Foundation and which is an environmental NGO. I'm not gonna tell you too much about our panelists just because I want them to really explain who they are and what they do to, um, for you. But he's currently Europe's uh, ocean literacy, liter oh my gosh, ocean literacy um, strategy coordinator. So you'll hear from him first. And then we have Josh McInnes. He's a UBC's master's student at the Marine Mammal Research Institute. And he studies bigs killer whales or transient killer whales. So really exciting there. And I think uh, he might have some really neat pictures to show us as well. And then we have Matt Drysdale at the Hornian Museum. He's an aquarist. And he also works on Project Coral. And our last presenter of the day will be Lizzie Daly. And she, living the wildlife biologist and filmmaker life, will be joining us a little late, just as she is currently stuck filming right now. But she'll be popping into the call uh, towards the end there to present with us. So without further ado, I'll now pass it on to Rebecca. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ali. And thanks, everyone, for just bearing with me uh, whilst doing all of the, the settings. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen um, and start our presentation. Um, so uh, this is obviously our first ever workshop, like Ali mentioned. Um, and We've been doing a couple of webinars, uh, which Ali has been leading. Um, so you might have kind of come across those. We've covered topics such as ocean plastics and ocean positive businesses. We're also going to be having a webinar on fisheries really soon. So look out for that one. Um, and if you're not familiar with the Marine Diaries, uh, we are a, a nonprofit organization using digital media to communicate uh, ocean science to the public. And um, joining me today, we also have Rita and Lewis, who are going to be helping kind of field your questions um, and for a bit of tech support. So thank you to them for, for joining. Um, we're going to be hearing from some fantastic panelists, as Ali has mentioned, um, who hold various positions in the ocean industry. Um, we'll also be having a little kind of interactive session where you guys can kind of say hello and say where you're from. Um, and just in terms of questions, you may have already seen the Google Doc, but please feel free to just write your questions directly into that Google Doc. Um, there are slides for each panelist. There are also slides for just questions to all the panelists. Um, we'll try and get through as many as possible. Um, and if you would like to come up onto the screen um, to directly ask the panelists your question, then please leave your name in the in the kind of box. Um, as we do have quite a lot of people on the call, if you can be as brief as possible when you come up to the stage, then we can get through as many as we can. Um, and just bear with us if we have any technical glitches. Obviously, this is quite a large Zoom call. It's our first kind of foray into a workshop. Um, so hopefully it all will run smoothly um but yeah please bear with us um and like Ali mentioned that this will be recorded we'll be sending it around along with the slides as well as the presenters presentations um and we'll be sending a small feedback questionnaire um so any feedback you can give us will be greatly appreciated um so based on the the questionnaire that we we kind of sent you uh with the google sign up form a lot of you guys are studying um, at the moment, either your undergraduate degree or your master's degree. Um, and a lot of you kind of expressed an interest in pivoting your career, um, such as from being a teacher to a science communicator. Um, and there are so, so many options when it comes to um, ocean related jobs. You don't have to follow a set career path. And um, we really hope this workshop is going to show you um, you know that that is the case and offer you practical advice on how to follow your chosen career um, to give you an overview of what a day in the life of um, an ocean job looks like um, and yeah we hope it's really useful so we'll move on to our short um, interactive session if you want to click on the link uh, that's in the google doc or go to menti.com and type in the code if you're signing in from a mobile so i'm just gonna switch screen sharing 
two. So if you want to write your name in, um, we can all say hi. Um, and this is just a really fun um, tool that basically um, is kind of live data. So we'll, we'll have a couple of minutes where everyone can, can type in their name. Um, if you don't want to add your name, that's, that's completely fine. Um, but I thought it'd be quite fun to, to see who we've got here. Um, and on the next slide, we're going to be um, just pinning on a, on a map where you guys are located so we can see where everyone's tuning in from around the world. So we'll just give a, a few more minutes um, on this slide and then we'll, we'll move on to the next one. We actually had over 600 people sign up for this. Um, so it's a really, really overwhelming response um, and we're, we're really happy with it. Oh, someone's typing. <laughs> Hi, Lisa. <laughs> right, so I think we'll move on to the, to the next one now. Um, sorry if you haven't had a chance to, to write your name in yet, but you can, um, you can keep writing your name in and we'll, uh, we'll share the results later on. So you should be able to now go on to the next slide. Let me know if that's not the case. There we go. So hopefully we've got people from all around the world. Based on the, the time differences, it might be a very early morning or very late evening for some people. So lots from the UK, I think. <laughs> so we'll just have a few more minutes on this um, and then we'll be moving on to uh, panelists' presentations. Great, so it looks like we've got people from almost every single continent, um, which is really, really lovely. Um, and now I will pass back on to Ali. Make sure I'm unmuted before uh, I speak again. So we'll start off um, to tell you a little bit about himself and kind of what he does at the Sir Frider Foundation. I would like to pass it off to Yan to kind of introduce who he is, how he got into his career, and what policy and ocean literacy is all about. So I'll pass it over to Yan. Thank you, Rebecca, for your presentation. And if you have any questions for Yan whilst he's speaking, feel free to, to drop them in the slides. Well, hi, uh, thanks, Rebecca. Thanks, Ali. Um, well, well, first of all, I'm sorry if I look a little bit tired, but I just went back. Um, luckily, I just went back from four dives in two days. So I'm, I'm kind of another planet at the moment. <laughs> uh, but it's a pleasure to be here. Um, well, where to start? Uh, I think First of all, I can start with the very beginning on how I went to work and I came to work for Sir Frederick Foundation Europe. Um, I have a master's degree in, uh, in conflict management, uh, so military conflict and risk management uh, from the University of Hong Kong. Uh, I didn't actually follow the path to actually manage conflict and doing peacekeeping. Uh, we used to have like a class on environmental protection um, on actually on all environment issues could lead, lead to conflicts. 
And uh, I actually found that pretty interesting. I think uh, when I'm talking about my interest, I think my interest always have been about water. I think water would be like a, is or would be or is for centuries a source of disputes. Um, so that, that's how I came to, uh, to get interested with, uh, with water at, at the large scale. And since I'm from the south of France, I must say that uh, we have had the chance to go to the ocean quite a lot uh, while being young. So that's all. So I came to love the ocean and love to protect it. Um, I think I got the interest in, in environmental protection and ocean protection when, when I was a kid uh, in, the, in the sandy beaches of Land in France. Uh, there was like a, a ship that sunk and um, like uh, gave the world a nice oil spill. So the people were, uh, were actually being stuck on the beach or what the other alternative is going into the water and for 10 minutes, get a lot of oil on your skin and then spend like two hours at the lifeguard uh, place to get yourself um, clean. And then, and then spend like 10 days, uh, well, if you're lucky in your bed uh, because you're, you're being sick, um, from, I don't know, from oil, uh, oil disease and things like this. So, I mean, it started quite a long way back, I would say like 25 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, now today I have the chance to work for Surfrider Radio Foundation Europe for five years. Uh, I'm the head of sports and ocean literacy at the European level. Uh, one part of my job is, um, is to determine all the all the old sector of sports can actually move uh, towards like more sustainable practice, and like most notably, all surfing, uh, diving, or kayaking, sailing, or those people and the, the people that practice the sport, they can actually enjoy the sport uh, without uh, being harmed or encountering issues with water quality and in the same time avoid to have like uh, too much impact on the environment. So it goes both ways, uh, trying to protect the health of the practitioner and protect, protect the environment. Um, so basically going back to the roots of uh, the surfing community. Uh, so that's one part. And the other part is uh, my job is to work with ocean literacy. Uh, so what is ocean literacy? It's a, it's a great question. Uh, we consider ocean literacy as all the aspects and all the knowledge that uh, you can actually gather or, or you educate people or, or you inform, you lead in research uh, to get like a better knowledge of the ocean and ocean protection. Um, so basically what I'm doing, uh, I used to work with kids in the past. Uh, we used to go and discover the environment, like um, often with kids that never see uh, the ocean, because we talk with them about protecting something that they never saw. So it's kind of complicated in the end, because they don't have like a full grasp of what it means to be close to the ocean or what it is. Like everybody say, protect the environment, protect this, uh, protect the ocean, protect the sea, protect the river. But some of the population and some of the cities, and they never actually encountered this, uh, this environment. So it's really hard to, to grow emotion inside a human being when, you don't, when this human being doesn't know what you're talking about. So um, we created programs to actually bring these people um, to the ocean or to rivers or to lakes. Uh, so to teach them, to bring them knowledge and to empower them. So then when they actually come back to where they live, they can also share the knowledge with, uh, I don't know, with other kids or with other people, with their parents, et cetera, et cetera. 
Uh, so that was one part of my job. Now I'm being like uh, boring and everything because uh, I had to leave my board shorts and uh, my sunglasses. And most of the time I have to wear a shirt and a tie and going to uh, EU institutions or into webinars. Uh, so it's really another world for me, but uh, that's, that's great as well, because that's where we actually decide on what are the best strategies to adopt or to set up uh, in order to, uh, to reach out to more people, uh, to engage more people, um, to make the link. You know, there is something as well as like sometimes we don't know. There is like, um, uh, how to say, uh, there is communication blind spots. Uh, for instance, like some universities, uh, they have knowledge about something. Uh, about like a specific research and we don't know about it. So it's important to create networks so we can have exchange of information, uh, we can have exchange of knowledge and to reduce these uh, knowledge blind spots. It's also a void to have like thousands of different figures about like ocean protection that gravitates in the world and have like something more, uh, let's say like more consensus about like big figures. So then it's also, it's easier to, to share the message and in terms of um, in terms of credibility, it's important you know to have like the right uh, the right figure or the right uh, knowledge so the people that can use it and, uh, and spread the world. So that's the concept of ocean literacy. Um, so I just hope that I don't discourage people to actually take my spot. Uh, that's not at all the idea, I think, and the process of this uh, <laughs> of this exchange. Uh, I think it's all a question of process. Um, I've had this discussion quite a lot. I think it's it's really hard the way the educational system are made of uh, or what they actually require from someone. Like really soon when you are 15 years old, they tell you, they ask you what you want to do when you're older. So when you want to be a fireman or when a firefighter, or if you want to, uh, if, you, if you know that you love orcas, then it's pretty much easy. But when you don't really know, I think it's important to go and try a lot of different things um, see what works, um, see what doesn't. And the most important thing is uh, to try to know who you are as a person before to know what you want to do. So, because when you know who you are, then you actually know what makes you feel good. And when you feel good, that's also the emotion that you will spread with other people. You know where and in what kind of job you want to work. And then that's where you make. And it makes sense uh, that this beautiful sentence of my life makes sense at the moment. That's pretty much this idea. So um, don't worry, don't rush anything. Uh, look at me, I've started with a postgraduate degree on, uh, I mean, with a master's degree in conflict management. I used to work in, uh, for private sector uh, in startups. Uh, and in the end, uh, even within Surfrider Foundation Europe, I've started with the mobilization and network development. And then I worked at the education. And now I'm using like education in a different way and also mixing it with sports. So, um, you know, you can create your own path. Uh, nothing is fixed. It's just when you really do love something or do enjoy doing something, just do it. And if you don't, just it's fine. And it's all we all are smart people. Um, we love doing what we do. So just try doing it. And if there is no company smart enough to hire you because they don't uh, trust who you are, and then maybe try to create your own system and do your own thing. And and I think that's basically it. Perfect. Thank you, Ian. Um, I would like to put it out there for anyone to ask you any questions, kind of, and there's two ways you can ask questions. Um, you can either raise your hand in Zoom and we can call upon you and unmute you, or we also have some questions in the Google Slides that we've put up. Um, 
So maybe I'll ask you one of the Google Slides questions as we see if anyone uh, raises their hand in the Zoom and wishes to be called upon. Um, first of all, Ian, what is the best way to get involved with local surf rider chapters or how do I start there on my own? Um, well, it's, it's a good point. I, I've seen that there were like a lot of people from um, Europe. Uh, so I'm representing surf rider Europe uh, so the European structure, but we also have like international networks. So we have self in the US, uh, self in Canada, um, a little bit in South America, but Morocco, uh, Australia, etc. Uh, the last one was Senegal. So basically, I'm, I may use this example because it's really interesting. They came to us uh, for support because they had, they needed knowledge to um, the exact same questions like. Or can we be involved even though we live in Senegal and we have like a local issues? So we help them actually to, to create a structure at the national level uh, to find like common issues that we fight for. So or we'll fight against marine litter and fight for better water quality, coastal management. Uh, and then we need to make sure that these people, uh, you know, they are really engaged and they want to engage for a long, uh, for a long time. Because so that is the question, you know, when you want to start a structure, you need at least people that are dedicated to it for a few years, uh, some of them for decades, but at least like, to, you know, to have like a solid base. Um, but if you just want to, um, if you just want to, um, I don't know, get engaged in a local chapter, you can go on the website usually of Surfer the US, Surfer the Foundation, uh, for Europe, Surfer the Foundation Europe. Uh, even though we were born in France, we do actually have an English page that makes like all the difference. And you can look at uh, chapters, uh, the list of chapters, and you can see like uh, where the chapters are located. Right in Europe, we're actually present in twelve European countries, I think. So from Portugal, um, Portugal, Spain, uh, all the Atlantic uh, side um, to Bulgaria, Romania. Perfect. Thank you, Yan. And then we have a question from Anna, so I'll pass that over. Hi, sorry, I think I was muted for a second. Um, I think my question was a bit related to the previous one, because I was not aware of the um, surf rider chap chapters or so. Um, but my question was mainly, what advice would you give uh, to start up a marine conservation project from scratch, like uh, capturing microplastics in Schreningen in the Netherlands? Because I'm from Spain, but I'm mainly based in the Netherlands. And I came across a surf rider project here in Barcelona. Um, and I got engaged with them or so, and I thought, oh, why can I not bring it there as well? And then they can collect even more data for the science that they want to produce. Uh, yeah, it's a great question. Uh, that, that's why having like the European network is quite useful because, I mean, we also have like a chapter in Netherlands. So then you can reach out to okay. them. Um, I mean, lastly, the, the questions were more turned towards water quality because there were like uh, kind of several incidents in Netherlands. But then, I mean, if you come up with the idea, then we can so we can see on how to actually materialize the, the data. Mm -hmm. uh, also create the, I mean, it all starts from an email, basically. Uh, and that's, I have a rule to always answer 100% of my emails. So. It can be a long time, but I always do it. Um, because then you can ask the question, and then we try to redirect it also with the actors within the network. Mm -hmm. uh, I know uh, Rebecca and I, we uh, encoded during like a EU for ocean network. So it's like a big platform for ocean literacy. Sometimes I don't have the answer. So I have no shame of saying that I'm not the right person to, be, to give you like this answer. But then I can also point you towards other organization that may support your project. So okay. I think the best advice is never, <laughs> it's the same as never stop yourself to ask a question. So never stop yourself to knock on the door. Um, like someone will answer for sure. 
Great, thank you. Great, um, one more question, Yen, and I'm choosing this question just because I think it applies to a lot of people who don't have the privilege to live on the ocean, but how can people get involved if they live in a landlocked place? Is there a way to get involved with policy or conservation if they're not living on the water? Well, there, there, there is always uh, there is always a way. <laughs> I think the um, you know, like we have chapters in in Romania and in uh, Switzerland, so like really far away from from uh, a coastline. Uh, mainly, mainly because I mean rivers, uh, small lakes. Um, I mean all the all the water streams they eventually lead. To uh, to the ocean, so that means that you can actually have like a, an impact, and you can have like a role to play, even though you don't live close to the ocean. That's that that goes back to my first, uh, like one of my first comments on on this question of emotion and the emotional link that the people have with the ocean. They can live like thousands of miles or kilometers away from the ocean, but since the ocean is what actually allows us to breathe in the warm, basically you everybody is linked to it. So you just need to grow more and more emotion within the within the person. And then there's like several programs. I mean, some people that are like uh, guardians of rivers. Uh, thinking about like the the kayak uh, some kayak federation uh there is also like people like uh, doing like observatory of um, endemic species uh for protection and research everything is interconnected so basically even though you live like uh, really far away from the ocean um, no there is no small uh small gesture to do <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Yan. I think we all learned a lot from that. Um, we'll end our question session there, but if anyone has any other questions for Yan, maybe add them into the doc and we can uh, see if you'll answer some questions by email after this. So thank you, Yan, for all that. I would like to now pass it over to our next panelist, uh, Josh, and he is our master's student at the UBC Marine Mammal Research Unit. So can't wait to hear from him. And I think he has some fun whale pictures for us as well. Hello, Josh. Hi, how are you? Um, yeah, I think I do hear them to share my screen. Um, here. Uh, there we go. Uh, can everybody see that? Um, there we go. Uh, yeah, so my name's Josh uh, McInnes. Um, I am a marine mammal uh, scientist. Um, at the University of British Columbia. Um, I'm excited to chat with everyone here because I'm, I know how it feels to feel a little um, lost in your career and uh, it's, uh, it's nice to be able to chat with everybody. Um, so yeah, um, this is a photograph I took in 2014. Uh, so this is in the beautiful Wanda Fuqua Strait. I'm from Victoria, British Columbia, Canada, uh, where I've spent pretty much my entire life um, following an animal. So I'm kind of the opposite of a lot of people, I kind of grew up loving nature. Um, I loved every little animal I could possibly think of. Um, spent my time on beaches, uh, looking at underneath tide pools and rocks. And, and then um, I grew up on North Vancouver Island. So if you're, you've been to Vancouver Island or British Columbia, it's kind of iconic for its killer whales. Um, and uh, I started quite young. Um, the next photo here, let's see, uh, can I switch it? It's weird. Let's see, I guess I have to do it. Ah, there we go. Perfect. Um, I grew up in uh, an area near Telegraph Cove. So this is Telegraph Cove here in northeastern Vancouver Island. Um, so it's a small little community. I was just on the outskirts of it. And we were able to ride our bikes down to the, the water every day and jump on whale watching boats or in our own boat and um, go out and look for whales. And uh, everybody knew each other in this community. So it was very small. It's kind of in the middle of a, a mountain range and really near the coast. Uh, so uh, the big the big industries are logging and fishing. Uh, those are the two big ones. And uh, uh, that's kind of what dominated the coastlines. So when you're in this kind of small community and there's not much to do, you really kind of look for uh, nature and wildlife. And um, for me, it was uh, the orcas. Um, they used to swim right by our house every day. Um, you could see them from 
where you were sitting. And uh, I got my first real experience um, with um, a population of killer whales called the transients, which I've spent most of my adult life now studying over a decade now. And uh, I kind of was the opposite too of most people. I didn't go into my undergraduate studies um, right away. Actually, I saved them for later. Um, I got into research and and uh, before that, and spent a lot of time studying and working in ecotourism, and uh, and then decided that research was really where I wanted to go. So when I was in my mid twenties when I decided to go to um, to university and pursue a, a degree in academia. Um, so this photograph here is a terrible photograph, um, but I thought I would share it with you because this was actually one of the first encounters I had with a, a transient orca as I was uh, 12 years of age. Um, and my cousin and I at the time were fishing off a dock and um, often we just fish so we could catch something to take a look at it, ID it and throw it back. Uh, so we were always just really interested to see what we could figure out was in the water. And, uh, um, and then this one day we were kind of sitting there and uh, uh, some, so these dolphins are called Pacific white-sided dolphins. They're a, a a quite a large population in the northeastern Pacific and they came right into the harbor and there was a group of about 12 of them and they were swimming quite quickly towards um, where we were on the dock and this large group of uh, uh, transients actually came in and herded the dolphins and threw one through the air and that's where this photograph was taken. Um, there was uh, hundreds of people um, pretty much hundreds of people the whole entire population of Port Hardy were sitting on the shore watching um, one of the dolphins ended up uh, beaching itself and died on the beach. Um, and the killer whales captured another one. And at the time I was kind of just shocked by these animals because they're so um, intelligent, they're cunning hunters. Um, and right there, I started to go into a, a field of behavioral ecology. Um, so the next picture is kind of gruesome, I apologize, but in marine ecology, if you decide to go into a, a field of marine ecology or marine biology, you're gonna have to get used to necropsies. Um, so this is the dolphin here, uh, about two weeks later, uh, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada has set it aside and there's little me, um, uh, hands deep into this dolphin, um, deciding that this was it, this is, this is going to be the rest of my life. Um, I was going to study dolphins and whales and, um, the scientist on the, the right there in the yellow, um, is, uh, Kathy Heisey, who also is a, a marine ecologist here in British Columbia. And that was kind of my first, um, I was, I was hooked. Um, I want to know more about marine mammals. So I did everything I could. I, I jumped on, I had to get permission from my, my parents to actually join a whale watching company um, as a paid job at the age of 12. And I would go out on whale watching boats pretty much every day. Um, and then I started science projects in elementary school and into high school um, and would try to get into science fairs soaked up everything I could possibly think of, read every paper, book, um, tried to network with people and um, kind of start to build that career. Uh, we'd go on adventures to different places. This is a rubbing beach up in North Vancouver Island uh, where the killer whales actually come right up to the shore. There's a population called the Northern Residents, which are a salmon um, specialist population that they come and visit these beaches where they rub onto the rocks and we'd go camping onto into these areas and just um, wait for them and try to photo ID and study them and look at their behaviors. So it was very much an adventure. We would just go all over the place, often it was out of our own pocket funding wise and money. Um, and uh, this was kind of just, it was a very exciting time and um, yeah, I was very excited to do it. I got to know the different populations of killer whales. So the Southern residents I've worked on, um, with them quite a bit, uh, which are an endangered population of killer whales. Uh, transients though, my specialty, um, got to know the IDs. We actually photo identify them and, and look at populations through certain individuals, like every animal here, their saddle patch and their dorsal fin is unique. So we're able to know individuals just as I can tell differences between everybody in this, uh, this workshop here, just by looking at your picture. Um, so you get a little of a photographic memory. I know most of these whales now by heart. I know when their offspring are born and their babies. Um, I just uh, finished off a massive census project with the US government and uh, we cataloged every killer whale in California and Oregon. So that's coming out in about the next two weeks, I'm pretty sure. Uh, so what, what happened? Um, it, I, you know, I've seen a lot of people ask me, you know, how did you get into this? Why did you, you know, it's such a competitive field, marine mammal science. Um, how can I get into it? I agree. It is a very difficult field to get into. And I have always had a bit of an entrepreneurship mind and also a bit of a rebel mind in many ways. I decided that if I'm not going to be given a job, I'm going to create a job. And I, and that's just the way it's going to be. So I ended up, I approached a group in my early twenties and I was in 
uh, it was in my mid twenties. I started uh, I'm, I'm basically a nonprofit um, studying the transient population, and it was really fun. I it was me and a couple of students from a behavioral ecology class. We got together at UVic, the University of Victoria, and we were like, you know what, that's it. Let's put our brains to use and actually go out and just study these animals. So we got a sponsor. We approached from a local fishing group that has boats. They gave us permission to use boats um, and uh, to go out and study the whales. And that lasted about three years. And um, the project's still going though. It's now over over 10 years old. Um, oh, it's around 10 years old now. So we're, we're you know, it's been a great opportunity. Uh, lots of amazing people. We've got lots of opportunities to see whales. Um, these are some just some of the photos that we get to do and encounter transients hunting along the exposed coast of Vancouver Island. Um, but luckily, it's not just me. Uh, there's a lot of people that I've gotten to work with over the years, um, and we've done some amazing work. Uh, the Transient Project really was the student-based coalition that grew. So we were initially in Victoria collecting data, as about five or six of us from uh, university, and then you know we we got well known. We have a Facebook page. People started to follow us, um, and it grew. I ended up in Alaska. Um, we go every year to Southeast Alaska, and um, a company sponsored us. It's a awesome husband and wife that run a charter up there. We go for a week or two into the middle of nowhere. Like you can see this bottom photograph here. Um, and we, we, we look for whales. Uh, it's, it's such an awesome opportunity. And then it branched down to California and it just, it got large. Uh, we presented our results at multiple conferences. Uh, we've invited to the American Cetacean Society. Um, and a lot of this, you know, it looks like a lot of fun. You're working on the water. We're having, you know, we're out watching these amazing animals, but a lot of it now is a lot of paper writing, um, a lot of working on grants, um, a lot of social media. There's a, it's a, it's a completely diverse area, especially when you're trying to do it on your own. Um, and uh, I'm very proud to say that some of our accomplishments have been some of the publications that we've done. Uh, particularly, we just recently documented the first time killer whales have used, or transient killer whales in British Columbia have used, um, intentional stranding to go up on beaches to grab seals uh, which is only seen in the southern hemisphere and you probably watched bbc uh, so we published a paper on that recently uh, and then some of the you know the presentations that we've done around are around the globe um, and uh, yeah it's been it's been such a pr privilege uh, but well, before i did that though um some of the recommendations i did a lot of volunteering a lot of work with other organizations um i worked with the u.s government uh so NOAA, the national oceanic and atmospheric administration uh, we go out and do uh, feet surveys, um, some of it not so great. Uh, this up on the uh, left hand side here is um, an individual scooping whale poo um, from the water and it is not fun sometimes, especially with a whale, but this information tells us a lot about what they're eating, how their health is. Um, there's other times we're out there and we're, we're watching them or, you know, picking up intestines of a seal that's been killed by a killer whale. It can be quite a a, quite a process when you're you're doing field work other times it's amazing um we we're doing i was doing some work here at the royal bc museum um helping assemble the new killer whale exhibit and put, uh taking bones and skeletons into the, the the museum exhibit so it's sometimes it's a lot of fun so uh, doing a lot of work with different organizations and collaboration is so key um in 2015 my career kind of changed um my project grew to california and i ended up um, in monterey where i spend most of my career now studying the killer whales in california and some of the different cetacean which are whales dolphins and porpoise populations i was the research coordinator for about five years in monterey for marine life studies and um there's a photo of me in the yellow life jacket uh, we were filming rizzo's dolphins underneath the water um looking at behavior um and and that kind of grew and then the, it just grew from there i ended up um you know we were working with killer whales right in monterey um watching them how they're hunting gray whale calves as they're coming up the coast um we were looking at humpback whale a lot of necropsies on beaches um and it just it grew I ended up though, it grew so much that I ended up joining um, Lindblad Expeditions National Geographic as one of their lead um, uh, biologists um, and field guides. And I traveled around the world the last three or four years. I was in Antarctica. This is the fast ice right here. So I was standing in Antarctica. We were, and during one of these times, we actually were tracking killer whales and the killer whales were swimming along the fast ice here, hunting penguins. Uh, so going, you know, if, as a marine biologist, it was pretty spectacular. We crossed the Drake Passage from Ushuaia down to the peninsula where we were in some of the roughest seas that I've ever, I've ever been on um, and some of the roughest conditions. 
Uh, but just amazing when you get down there to see some of the populations of killer whales. Um, I was one of the luckiest people to actually see type D killer whales. Uh, if anybody knows those, it's a, it's a form of killer whale that is only was recently discovered in 2011. And um, it was published in 2011 as a new ecotype or a form of killer whale. Uh, so I got to see him twice in 2019 in the same year, which was pretty spectacular. Um, I was in the Arctic Svalbard um, tracking polar bears and looking for those on, uh, on ice. We were looking at beluga whales. Um, so I was up in the Norwegian Arctic. Um, now I can say, though, um, through all of that, I've been lucky enough to work with, um, I was brought on by the University of British Columbia last year as a graduate student. Um, and I'm now with the Pacific Wildlife Foundation. Uh, so I've joined a couple of different organizations um, and I'm working now on a, a major thesis looking at discerning the entire transient killer whale population uh, from Southeast Alaska to Southern California is my master's thesis. And, but my success really is in large part to the people I've been able to work with. That's a huge thing I can give advice to people that are interested in ocean sciences is that it's really make those connections without people out there, learn from people that are in your field. I've been lucky to, enough to have some amazing mentors. Um, uh, both from UBC and from these different organizations that have really kind of taught me how to be a good scientist and and to um, um, publish my work and work through research and be and that is just so important because honestly where I am today I, I'm very lucky. So yeah, I think that's uh, that's it for the slideshow, but I have I can take some questions for sure. Thank you, Josh. I think I can speak for all of us when I say, uh, wow, I really wish uh, you could just take me on all your expeditions. Uh, looks absolutely fabulous. I'm sure there are less glamorous aspects of it, but it looks pretty amazing. You did um, a great job of answering a lot of the questions that we've had so far, but I will go and first ask you a question that we've written in the slides. And also, if anyone has a question they would like to ask Josh, just once again, raise your hand and we can call on you and unmute you. Sorry, Josh, uh, you just uh, stop sharing your screen for oh, Yeah, sure. Yeah. There we go. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so I think one of the first questions I would like to ask you is, is it really as hard, as, is it hard to get a stable job in, my, in marine biology as it has been projected? How hard is it coming off as a student to find a consistent job, do you think, and as a marine biologist? That's a great question. And that's a very interesting question that I, you know, I've struggled with finding positions in marine biology. Um, finding a job in marine biology is, um, can be difficult, but it's also very different for where you're situated. Um, for instance, there's some places, some countries that have more employment than others. Um, uh, you know, it depends on the government at the time and who's involved. Um, for me, I found it very difficult because it's very competitive. Um, and I learned that if you really want to do something, it's best to do it yourself. Um, and the reason for that is that, especially if you want to be successful, one of the things I can mention is start publishing your papers, start publishing it, even if it's a short note, publish, publish, publish. And that was the advice I got from supervisors. Um, even if you're not in school, if you finished off your undergraduate, is to get involved with some researchers and write a paper with them. Once it gets published, that actually will circulate around academically, and it's a good way to get started. Um, people start to recognize your work, um, and that's an important part. But it can be difficult to get into to marine biology in general, especially in marine mammal science, because they're charismatic animals. And it's just best to just do what you can and um, and just lots of organizations out there to volunteer with and kind of build from. Thank you, Josh. Um, now, Pia, I know you asked a question. Oh, yeah. Would you like to ask your question, Pia, that you posted in the slides? Hi. Um, first of all, I kind of wondered if you offer volunteer opportunities, but I also had the question, um, wait, there it is. Um, what piece of advice you would give us, but I think you already talked about that. Um, yeah, volunteer opportunities. Um, we, we do have 
volunteers from time to time. Um, and we, you know, some of the studies that we have right now, especially with data, collecting data, and that's a huge thing. Um, we have a sightings database for killer whales. So people that send in a sighting of an orca, they see. And that database really looks helps us look at the distribution, occurrence patterns of different whales. And, and often we do have people that are really interested come on board. And especially even if you're in a different country, um, the nice thing about the internet now is that you can use Google Drive or Google Doc to work on a on a data sheet and learn. You know, we have a whole Google Drive set up with identification catalogs and things like that. So you can get involved. Um, we do look at social media. Um, so we do have opportunities for people that are interested. Yeah, definitely. And um, we're on Facebook, too. So uh, we have a page on there that uh, you can follow. I can I can. Uh, give that in the message or send it to, to the ocean divers here. They can, you can reach out. Perfect. Thank you, Josh. Yeah. Um, I think we have a link to your LinkedIn, but if you want to post your Facebook page in the chat later too, that would be great. Um, we have about three more minutes to ask you questions. So we'll have two raised hands here. So we'll see if we can uh, quickly get them going. Um, Filippo, if you want to ask your question next. Yeah. Hi. Um, uh, really nice your presentation of uh, the marine biology or uh, the difficulty in, in finding a, a job in marine biology. I'm an ecologist myself and I'm finding the same struggles. And one of the things I'm actually start thinking is actually to build something on my own. Uh, so I was interested in your um, example of funding uh, a non for profit organization. And so my question is, how difficult it is? Can you do it alone or you actually need a, a group of people to start off? Or, mm, I mean, is it complicated, like bureaucratically wise? Um, can, how can you attract sponsors and get funding to run then uh, your ideas? So if you can give us some advice on, on that, it would be nice. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I found it, you know, the reason why I did it is I, I just wanted to share information with people that, you know, I was excited about what I was doing and I wanted to share that with the world um, and seeing what I was seeing these, these animals. So it's not, in, it, there is many difficulties of starting your own thing, but it is a very good way of getting yourself recognized for positions in the future with other organizations. So in particular, if you have the drive and you're driven, it can be a curse and it can be a blessing. It can be the curse that you're also in competition with a lot of people and you have to have a bit of a thick hide and you have to be able to really go at it. And it can be a benefit though, because people do recognize what you're doing and they see what you're doing and it can be very, and then that can help you later on. Um, for me, I found that, yeah, it's good to have a good group of people. I had a couple of really awesome scientists that were with me at the time. Um, I'm still friends with them now and we still work together. Um, that really kind of helped uh, help me get things going. Um, but really, um, you have to be the energy of your organization. You have to be the person that brings that energy because other people will feed off of that energy. And especially if you have a vision, it's the most important part and you have to be that person. So it can take a lot of work and it can definitely be a little draining, but honestly, it's one of the best, the best opportunities I've ever had. I mean, because of the work I've done with killer in the past, and the reason why I got to Antarctica, um, some of the social media stuff ended, that's how I ended up in, in different areas of the world um, looking at killer whales and just branching from there. Uh, and now I'm lucky to be supported by a great organization, the Marine Mammal Research Unit at UBC. Um, it's because of those things, and, I, and it's because of the, pr the present work I did by myself. Perfect. Thank you, Josh. Thanks for that one. Um, we'll wrap it up with one last um, question here from Esser. Sorry if I pronounced your name wrong there. Um, let's see if we can unmute you. Hi. Okay, my question is. Hi. Okay, my question goes about it is about, for example, for the young teenagers who wishes to, to participate in a marine workshop. They do not know how to go about. What advice would you like to give them 
after that they can reach the true joy of this year. That is my first question. And then my second question is, I, what motivated you to participate or what made you to become a marine biologist? What was the main motive that made you to become the marine biologist? Sorry, I don't think I can hear you too well. I was trying to pick that up. Yeah, we have a bit of feedback there. Um, I heard your second question of what's the best way to become a marine biologist, I think, but I missed your first question. You want to type it into the into the chat, Asa? Yeah, I can answer the second question right now. And then if you type that into the first into the chat, I can and the first question I can. Yeah, so the best well, the advice I give for how to get into marine biology is definitely go you know, depends on what you want to do. If you want to be in academia or if you want to be in government or you want to be a nonprofit or three different, like the three main avenues that you can go. Um, I suggest one going, definitely get a degree. A BSc or an MSc is so important. I mean, even a BSc at least is so important. Um, it really sets you aside as an actual scientist. Um, two, doing while you're in your degree or even before you get into your degree, extracurricular activities are super important. So um, you'd be surprised how beneficial it is to volunteer, say for the US government group, like I did with NOAA or doing work with other organizations like the Royal BC Museum or something like that. And like there's examples, how beneficial that can be on your resume, especially if you have some field experience in that it can be, it can go a long ways. Um, and it can go a long ways when you're applying for your graduate studies, actually, because uh, even though graduate schools look at, um, at your grades and whatnot, you'd be surprised. My, my grades weren't the greatest in my undergraduate degree. And um, to get into graduate school and into a PhD, you'd be very surprised how far your extracurricular activities will take you, especially if you're doing a lot of field research. Um, uh, so that's some of the, the best ways to get into it is to try to get out there, try to volunteer for something and, and you know, build that, that resume. Perfect, thank you, Josh. Um, I think, Esther, if you wanna um, type your question in the chat, maybe we can get to it later as we have a lot more questions too. And maybe Josh will spend some time later posting some answers to the questions in the chat because everyone's interested in your career, Josh. And uh, thank you for sharing with us. No problem, thanks for having me. Thank you. All right, um, I, we're gonna move on to our next panelist now. Um, she has joined us. We're gonna add Lizzie in. Um, she was Hello. busy filming, so I'm so happy she's here to join us and talk to you all. Hello, Lizzie. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Sorry, sorry I'm a bit late. Um, but yeah, just caught uh, Josh's uh, presentation there. And uh, Josh, I'm sure, You'll have heard all about it, but there's um, been a lot of awkward excitement here as well in, in the UK. There's a pod called the West Coast Community Pod, um, which are down to the last two males. And they've been spotted, if everyone or anyone knows the UK on here, been spotted the furthest south ever. Um, they mainly are, are spotted around the Irish Sea and up on Scotland and around Ireland. So lots of awkward excitement this side. Um, but yeah, I'm sure everyone's in absolute awe of, uh, of your job, including myself. Should I share my screen? Would that be, see, look, I've done this so many times and I can't even work. Rebecca's given me the nod. Okay, share my screen. <laughs> okay, so my, um, my talk's, I guess, just going to be a little bit of an overview, to be honest. Um, let's go here. We're on. Yeah, to be honest, I, I really want to share with you, I guess, and get your questions about, about the, the synergy between wildlife filmmaking and science, because as Josh said, the value of connecting these two worlds is so, so important. And, you know, listening just then into like how important it is to bring in those extracurricular activities from an early stage. Well, that for me is really how I've managed to get to where I am today and how I guess I'm on that journey to, to get to where I want to go. So a little bit of background of, about me. I'm, um, I'm a biologist first and foremost and a broadcaster secondly. So I've, I've always um, gone out and made really rubbish videos about wildlife and things that I love and species on my coast and things that I can you know touch and see and smell. And, and uh, I've gone out and made videos um, about whatever I can because I've always had that kind of love and knew I wanted to a study animal behavior 
when I was super young, I, want, I knew I wanted to work with um, elephants, so not marine biology at all, but kind of through my, my love and passion um, for, and living on the coast, I've somehow really kind of delved into ocean storytelling. And as you all know on here, you know, the plight of many of our ocean species and the state of our oceans means that um, there's a lot of work to do in terms of campaign and storytelling. So my broadcasting side as a presenter and as a filmmaker is kind of delved into that. So this is a trip from uh, last March, actually in Antarctica, where I was there with BBC Earth and G Adventures to make a three part series about um, Antarctica and its wildlife. So I went to South Georgia and Antarctica. So, um, so yeah, so my background um, is I've worked with the BBC and National Geographic and Animal Planet and various other Kind of outlets for storytelling and as I say I've kind of always tried to marry uh, marry the two together. I studied a BSc in animal behaviour, I went um, that was at University of Exeter, then I went on to study a master's um, in Bristol University studying completely something just wildly different so I found out uh, my supervisor who was, his name was Daniel Robert, Professor, Professor Daniel Robert, a fantastic scientist who studied the hidden senses of arthropods and he looks at uh, electroreception so I'm sure many of you on here know electroreception in the marine environment through how sharks feed and how they navigate but in terrestrial species there's very little known about it in that environment and if they even use this as a sense and uh, Daniel Robert was looking at how bees are able to learn about their environment using this sense electroreception. And I was looking at it in ladybird larvae. So very different to orca like Josh and very different to what I'm studying now, uh, which is the African elephant. Um, so <laughs> very different. Uh, let me just go on to the next one. So. So yeah, so um, I'm based at Swansea University at the moment doing my PhD and we're looking at fine scale movement data from tags. They're accelerometer tags and uh, they're very, very small. And the whole point of my kind of study and area of interest is looking at identifying state in animals, the state from gait. So how you walk uh, is very, very different, even down to the, the day. It may be your energy levels. It may be your, you as a human, your happiness levels, it will change the way that you walk and we as individuals all have a different gait. And looking at these visualizations from this data, I'm hoping to learn more about individuals. So I've spent a lot of time out in Kenya in a place called Laikipia where there's a huge, huge amount of human and elephant conflict and individual elephants that are going into these high areas of amazing crops and decimating unfortunately entire entire areas which is proving hugely challenging for local communities who depend on these crops for their livelihoods so there's big big issues in what is ultimately a very big changing landscape as growing human populations are uh, encroaching more and more on these habitats so um, I'm currently working with uh, brilliant save the elephants and space for giants to get these tags on the gps collars of animals like um, African elephants to better understand their behavior and ultimately better understand their state. But the link, again, a bit of a random link. So last year we tried some deployments but I wasn't able to get out into the field. So um, at the moment I'm looking at data on penguins and we talked about kind of how you feel, how that may change your gait. Well, when a penguin um, goes out to sea, it may be empty, right? So if it's stepping from left to right in a visualization what you can see would be a very or depending on the environment and a number of other factors but the visualization of that is going to be very different from the state pattern of when that penguin comes back because when that penguin comes back from sea hopefully it's full of food it's a lot fatter a lot more round and so all of a sudden that lovely kind of left right step is now more of a bit of a waddle, is more of a bit of a figure of eight. So um, yeah, sorry penguins, but uh, for me, it's about mapping that, <laughs> it's about identifying that and, uh, and uh, using kind of data analysis to, to actually look at what that means. And if we can learn more about foraging efficiency and, and prey catching and, and all sorts. So it's a very simplified uh, kind of overview of some of the data that I'm looking at at the moment, but that's kind of, a really important arm um, for me of what I do and I'm very lucky to be at Swansea University to work with a brilliant team 
my supervisor, Professor Rory Wilson, who is an animal movements um, expert. He's absolutely fantastic. So very lucky to, to be doing that. The other side, as I mentioned, is wildlife film. So very passionate about celebrating nature on our doorsteps, wherever you are watching from. So uh, a few years ago, I set out around the UK and I said, right, no one thinks there's any wildlife in the UK. There's nothing exciting going on here. So I'm going to prove them, uh, prove them wrong. And we did a week long around the UK. Uh, we missed the orca, Josh, up in Scotland by a day. Um, but we had a breaching minke whale and we had pods of dolphins and giant colonies of gannets and just amazing things all in one week that the idea was to kind of showcase what you can see in a short amount of time and the last day we were supposed to finish on blue sharks but um, instead went for a dive and uh, encountered a giant giant barrel jellyfish which actually uh, if anyone's kind of seen those memes about something that's very far away and close and perspective um, the jellyfish is actually the same size as me and I'm not a giant, but um, it's pretty, pretty big. And it was the biggest one I've ever seen. They're the UK's largest jellyfish species. And what's exciting about this is I posted this online. Uh, I get, it just wasn't like a BBC production. This wasn't, you know, really big funded um, kind of lots of people talk about the barriers of getting into wildlife film. And I talked at the beginning about how I got into it. I just set this whole week up with my friend who can film and we went together and we raised money for a wildlife charity and we just wanted to showcase what, what we're passionate about. And this went on to, uh, for me, spark a real curiosity about jellyfish because there seems to be big gaps in our knowledge about jellyfish species. Um, we really don't know kind of how many species wash up here. But what I did find out with chatting to scientists at Swansea University that um, they have really kind of complex behaviours, jellyfish. They change the way they move, where they move, obviously depending on, on food and plankton, um, in shores and warmer waters, but actually up and down water columns and over big, big distances. So off the back of this, we set up a, a genuine citizen science project at Swansea University called the Great British Jelly Watch Weekend. Yes, uh, <laughs> and trying to encourage more people to get out involved and and um, and noting how many jellyfish are washing up on the beaches and helping scientists kind of build up that picture. So that'll be something that's going ahead this year. Um, the other kind of power, I guess, of, of putting together these films is you can really put, well, for me, I think it's really valuable to integrate it with genuine change, right? You're ultimately trying to make a film to make impact. And um, one of my real loves is our grey seals here in the UK. And I, I uh, put together a documentary about the impact of salmon farming in our environments and how uh, many seals are actually being shot at salmon farms at the expense of our appetite for salmon. It's such a big part of our landscapes up in Scotland here in the UK, uh, having salmon farms. So I could do a whole talk about that, but I won't today. Um, but it's uh, that's kind of, for me, the... Uh, an example, if you like, of how actually, while making great films about jellyfish is one thing and getting people excited, engaged, inspired, this is also a really good tool to kind of take it forward to policymakers or government and really kind of think about what the, what the impact can be, how you measure impact. And so that's something that's always been really important for me and started with, um, this is actually an image, not, not the best image, apologies, but this is uh, from uh, Peter Coles, who is at the University of Exeter. This was taken in uh, one of my first years in university where a group of us who were studying animal behaviour and zoology at the university said, we want to just, you know, talk about what's on our coast. We formed a group called Nature Watch and we went out and did a video about busking sharks and various other kind of local species as well. So if you are in university or not, you know, look for your peers and people in your circles or find the people who you can join their circles to start creating these groups and making films and making impact projects and getting involved because this for me was a again another stepping stone and an opportunity to um to celebrate local wildlife. Um, so yeah, I just threw in a few extra clips here. This was um, <clears throat> this is a clip taken from an Antarctica with leopard seals. Again, I love pinnipeds so much, but um, 
this is a, a just one of those amazing experiences that that will be made um for for these videos and the leopard seal is just again such a bad reputation or they have a menacing reputation i should say when actually they're incredibly social um uh, well more social than we thought and incredibly intelligent animals very curious animals they are they're some of my favorites so you know we talk about what do we do we make with wildlife film and how do we want to change that in our conversations well for me it's again about celebrating the um the unseen or unloved species and also changing our perception of, of perhaps those that have kind of got a bad name such as our sharks or our leopard seals and um my, my last real kind of point is um and my love is is seabirds i mean you can ask me anything about marine species i'll tell you i love it all but uh, <laughs> seabirds is a group that i just they just don't get enough in wildlife film you know i'd love to see more on our seabirds this is um a uh, clip of northern gannets off of uh, the Isle of Noss in Shetland and uh, again just a fantastic bird the UK's largest um, wingspan uh, a brilliant brilliant bird but really in the wildlife film world we need to start kind of seeing and celebrating a species like our seabirds which let's be honest are huge indicators of the health of our oceans they um, unfortunately are declining at huge speeds, depending on the species, location, kind of geography of where these birds are. But of course, many of them migrate over these huge, huge distances. We've got a fantastic population of Manx Shearwater here in Wales, which are officially back, uh, was there last week on Skilma Island. And unfortunately, these Manx Shearwater face huge um, issues, which I'm sure you've all seen in, in wildlife documentaries as well uh, with plastics and of course the climate crisis. So um, let me escape this. I mean, I, I said it was gonna be a bit of a, a jump around overview of what I do, but I think I just wanted to um, uh, give you a bit of background as to how kind of these two worlds are very different, but very, very important. And um, I think uh, a, co a combination of, of both of those worlds has been a really important part for me in kind of figuring out what kind of scientist I want to be and how valuable it is to marry these two worlds together because there are some brilliant scientists and some brilliant research projects out there which would you know their work should be amplified and and often the wildlife film industry doesn't make that connection or sometimes there's even worries that, that connection um it is is handled incorrectly and ends up damaging those relationships so having scientists in the wildlife film world and wildlife film in, in the science world is just a really really crucial relationship to establish and to do so well so having a foot in each one of those is, um is really important so there we go we're stop tour thank you <laughs> how do i stop sharing uh thank you Lizzie. I think you'll be at the bottom of your screen. You'll find a stop sharing. Dear me, you just think <laughs> I just know this, but I don't. <laughs> stop sharing. Oh, I'm so sorry, everyone. <laughs> Such a technophobe. <laughs> I've got it. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Thank you for that, Lizzie. Um, once again, everyone, if you have questions, <laughs> either post them in the doc or raise your hand and we'll call upon you to unmute you. Um, perfect. We already have a raised hand, so we'll start here. Ask to unmute. There we go. Hello. Hello. Hi, I'm I'm Johan from Sri Lanka, and I really inspired by your story that you are studying about African elephant too. Uh, my question is, I, uh, I'm an undergraduate student in zoology. In Sri Lanka, we have a lack of marine biology education, like, like degree or like those stuff. So a lot of people leave, leave the country. So how about like studying a zoology and wildlife conservation? And I really want to study uh, about marine conservation, like that, these things, because these are very important to my country, because I'm in a tropical island in Asia. So what is your idea about that? So um, are you asking me where you should study or ideas about kind of good places to study marine biology? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I mean, I can only share with you, I guess, my experiences. Um, and you're totally right in saying, you know, if, if you can find a university that has access to that environment, 
absolutely brilliant. You know, University of Exeter for me was based on a Cornwall campus in the UK. So they have a really, really great marine biology department. And of course you have the advantage of, of being on the coast and you have access to some brilliant research projects and some supervisors who are carrying out work with, you know, tuna and um, basking sharks and blue shark tagging and various other projects. Um, Swansea University, I would, I'm just going to shout out all the universities I'm affiliated with, but Swansea University is also fantastic if you're interested in animal behaviour, they've got a great SLAM lab which is all about animal movements and um, up in Wales, North Wales, there's also a Bangor, so B-A-N-G-O-R University, is also brilliant for, for kind of global uh, marine behaviour and ecology. Um, they have kind of lots of, uh, I believe they have some schemes and programmes available for international students as well. So check those three out. But um, uh, to be honest, I'm sure, I'm sure Josh could probably advise and all the other brilliant speakers could probably advise some universities as well. But those would be my, my top three. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Perfect. Thank you, Lizzie. I'm going to ask a question. Oh, we got another raised hand. I'll do the raised hand one first. Did someone just say Bangor represent? That is brilliant. I love it. <laughs> um, so I first wanted to say thank you for all the energy, Lizzie, because it's been like such an inspiring um, talk. Um, and I just had a question around universities as well. My background um, in my BA is events management. So it's quite generic and non-related to marine biology at, at all. But I'm now kind of looking into going into university so I can study more into this field. And I, I was wondering what kind of preparation should one do um, when you don't have necessary studies um, in this field? Um, and like, what would a, yeah, an application kind of uh, stand out with? Um, what kind of activities or knowledge? Yeah. Really good question. Um, I think from my understanding, it, it varies depending on what university you're looking at and also depending on what kind of course you want to go into. So, for example, it may be quite a hands on course, in which case you may be better off looking at volunteer opportunities uh, wherever you may be or looking at kind of even projects you can get involved with. The beauty of having, I guess, social media now is that actually you may not act physically be there and be on the ground and carrying out that work but you may be able to kind of get your foot in the door with some good conservation organizations or campaigns and get in touch with them I think it's very good as kind of referring back to what Josh was saying is really start to think of like what extracurricular activities you can do now um, so yeah vo volunteering uh, looking at any kind of conservation organizations that you align yourself with um, if it's wildlife film or kind of uh, wildlife conservation storytelling you want to do, start making your own videos. I always recommend that kind of get out there and start doing that. And also approach, you know, if you are someone with um, even basic social media skills or someone who knows how to put together a really good story, you could approach a really great research group or conservation team that you think, oh, my gosh, their work's brilliant, but they're kind of missing a trick. And you could say, hey, like, I really know how to put together reels and Instagram stories and TikTok or whatever. Um, I'd love to do a, like, a weekly fact video about like some of your species that you study or something like that. I mean, it's kind of think creative, think outside the box um, and kind of start to connect. Connecting is so, so important at an early stage and as, yeah, kind of fill up that portfolio early on. I hope that helps. Yeah, cool. Double thumbs up. That's good. Perfect. I'm actually going to ask a question from the doc as I think it's a really neat question. Um, what tips do you have from someone wanting to conquer children's TV? This was asked by Natasha. Good question. Okay, so story, I'll keep it short. I, um, I started making YouTube videos. That was my first place and I posted them online and at first no one was spotting them at all. Uh, and I had an email one day from a producer from the CBBC uh, head of and said, I have spotted your video on YouTube. Um, we want to give you an audition for a CBB series. This is why I hammer home the importance of actually going out there and making your own stuff and putting it online. I think if you are perhaps, let's go for a presenter role, you're going to want to bring a lot of, a lot of energy. People want to see your passion, your interest. Um, I think if you are wanting to 
kind of be a wildlife filmmaker and create kind of high energy videos. Think very much in how, how you are telling that story. Do you have young cousins or friends with a young baby? Maybe not literally a baby, but someone young enough that you can actually find out what they want to know, what's engaging, um, find kind of ways of easily of, of telling natural history stories that's um, if it's wildlife presenting you want to go into on your doorstep you know show them the millipedes in the garden the brown centipedes in the the dry pile or what's in the leaf litter etc show them kind of the the ecology of trees think of think creatively of kind of bringing that energy that kids love uh to the table if it's um i wasn't sure if the question was in reference to wildlife specifically but i know that kids tv and things like cbbc and nat geo kids it's all about the energy. It's all about the passion. And um, if you're someone who's passionate and, and kind of has that real love, then I'm sure you'll you'll have a really good chance of um, of doing it, of getting involved. But yeah, top tip is get out there and start put, putting stuff online. Perfect. Thank you, Lizzie. Um, kind of two more questions here that kind of blend into one. But first of all, do you have any basic equipment recommendations to start up a YouTube channel or podcast? Mm -hmm. And then do you have any tips how to make a debut in the wildlife documentaries? Oh, good question. Okay, first kit suggestions. I kid you not, I would say an iPhone at this stage. If you're somebody, it really depends on your on your budget. So if you're somebody who, you know, really just doesn't want to spend loads of money on a camera until you've kind of got your craft mustard use an iPhone that you've got or your your whatever phone that you may have. But, you know, if you're going to invest lots of money into a camera, you may be better off upgrading your phone to a higher level, um, quality level, because you can shoot in slow-mo and 4K now and all different features. So uh, that for, for YouTube. And then from there, I would say you could probably even look at doing, getting a digital camera or even a GoPro and action camera can cover a lot of those bases which you can take off fisheye and you can have like a nice linear 4K image. Um, and then kind of going up again, I would say uh, in price now, I would say what you're looking for is like a DSLR, I'm a Canon girl, so DSLR, a wide angle lens. <laughs> Rebecca's giving me the thumbs up. Um, a wide angle lens, if anyone wants to kind of actually have specs of that, just send me a message after this and we, I can kind of give you an example of um, some of the lenses I've got. But yeah, it's really, really depends on on how much you want to spend. And for audio, clip on mics, you can buy them online really easily. Once you can literally just plug into your phone. Um, I may be wrong in saying this, actually. I'm sure my bosses and professional colleagues will be like, oh, don't suggest this. But actually it works. You just want something, audio is so, so important. So you just want something that's going to be easy. All you have to do is plug in that mic into your phone. Uh, Rhodes do clip on mics. So they're the ones with the long wires in the middle just black poof at, at the top there um so that's kit recommendations and breaking into the industry oh gosh I sound like a broken record but getting your films online definitely collaboration is key so if you're somebody who really is looking you know to uh focus your energy on Bristol at their natural history unit in Bristol is a really good place you know connect with yourself with like-minded people and similar groups there's discussions happening all the time um, on platforms like Clubhouse, which is actually how I connected with the brilliant Rebecca here as well. Um, the the kind of the social aspect of it is is really, really important because you can learn so much from others and it's very much a collaborative teamwork environment. So if you are somebody who perhaps has a really good story, but doesn't have a high level production or isn't someone who uh, has a contact in the BBC, why not come up with a really killer story uh, and, and really put some time in storyboarding that together with somebody, bring in friends, you know, lots of people want experience with wildlife filmmaking or sound, bring in a small team of you and put together your own film and spend lots of time crafting what that looks like. And if you put that out there, at least when you approach others in the wildlife filmmaking industry, you'll be able to go to them with a piece of work because a lot of people just say, hey, I wanna do wildlife film. And it's like, cool, show me your work, like show me your show reel. What have you kind of done in your extracurricular activity to kind of boost your, your um, evidence of work? So yeah, start as soon as you can and, and uh, surround yourself with like-minded people who kind of want to do the same because there's lots of us. <laughs> 
Thank you so much, Lily. Those are some uh, great uh, tips and advices. And yeah, maybe if you want to send an email to uh, Rebecca or myself about your specs for lenses, we can um, post in a document we'll send out at the end. As I know there is some interest in uh, getting into the industry for sure. Mm -hmm. I know you have to hop off this uh, call soon as you have another one coming up as you're very busy. So thank you so much for your time and all your information. Thank and you. Thank you. Yeah, it's been brilliant. Thanks, everyone. Good to meet you all. <laughs> Bye. Thanks. And we'll go over to our last panelist now who will be presenting our aquarist, uh, Matt. So hello, Matt. I'll pass it over to you. Hey, guys, you all right? OK, I'm just going to square share my screen real quick. OK, uh, so hey, guys, um, my name's Matt Drysdale, and I'm just going to talk to you a little bit this evening about um, being an aquarist. So as I said, my name's Matt Drysdale. I'm currently 28 years old, and I'm currently working as an aquarist at the Honma Museum and Garden. Um, I've kept uh, tropical fish since I was 13, started with um, tropical freshwater fish in my, in my bedroom, and uh, sort of from there, gone on to get my uh, undergraduate degree in coastal marine biology at the University of Hull. Um, and then went on to do my master's in tropical marine biology at the University of Essex. Uh, and from there, I'm now working into my third year in the public aquarium industry. Uh, before that, I had experience working in the home aquarium industry and then uh, lots of volunteer experience. This was at um, both my university's uh, aquariums and as well as um, marine biology fieldwork experience as well. And I've also uh, maintained my own uh, marine aquarium systems for over seven years, keeping a wide variety of uh, fish and corals at home. So what is an aquarist? When, often when I tell people that I'm an aquarist, I get a lot of funny looks because it's not your sort of usual sort of job title. People are a bit confused by it. I like to describe it as a as sort of like a wet zookeeper. So like the way a keeper in a zoo tends to and cares for their animals. We do the same things with the, with the wet animals we have in the aquarium. A basic breakdown of my role is about probably 80% water quality management and about 20% animal uh, behavior and care. Um, I say this because similar to us, we live in air all the time. And if our air, water, if our air quality isn't very good, we don't do very well. Um, likewise, with a fish living in water all the time, if its water quality isn't very good, it doesn't do very well either. We keep a, a huge, a hugely wide variety of species at an aquarium at any one time, which is the same pretty much across the board. Um, and each individual species has its own individual um, set of care requirements that it needs to um, be considered at all times in order for it to thrive and do well. But there is also a, a really nice balance of creative and scientific tasks as well. So if I, what I've listed before is a scientific task, um, there's also a good amount of creative um, tasks as well. Um, for example, uh, when you decide that designing them as a display, things like the rules of thirds that you take in with photography, as well as like color composition is all important as to, into designing a, a sort of successful display. Like um, Jan was saying earlier, it's all about making an emotional connection. And if a, if a display doesn't look very good, it's more difficult to do that. And it's a, it's a very hands-on position as well. Um, so there's no real better way to sort of learn the animals than to go into work every day and, and care for them essentially. Um, it's, it's a really nice and, and rewarding um, job to have when, when it all works and you see your animals thriving. The day to day work, um, so the first thing I'll do in the morning is basically go in and check the health of anything, of, of everything, all the animals in the aquarium. Um, this is just sort of like visual checks and then go on to the feeds. Um, the feeding in itself is, in, is an entirely separate industry, it's a really in depth sort of topic. Um, just a few simple examples, for example, uh, is like um, not every fish is the same size. so you want to think about things like particle size when you're feeding, um, but not everything has the same size mouth. So if you put a big thing in for a small fish, it's not going to be able to eat it. It's not very efficient. And then you need to make sure about like um, varied diets and things like that to make sure everything has the right amount of nutrients and, and uh, uh, vitamins and things like that, that um, it needs to stay healthy and survive. Uh, water quality testing, like I've meant, uh, touched on before, um, I'm sure everyone's uh, sort of um, familiar with the idea of like a water quality testing kit and um, we carry out a suite of these on a regular basis to ensure that sort of water quality doesn't deteriorate too far to the point where um, animal health will 
deteriorate. Um, and if it does, we also have strategies and, and uh, plans in place to make sure that it can be rectified before it does damage. Um, these vary on a on a animal to animal basis as well. Another aspect of my position is um, equipment servicing. So the life support systems that keep the um, uh, the the animals healthy and all the things behind the scenes. Um, this is a wide variety of, of the things that you need to be up on. Essentially, this can be anything as simple as a heater that keeps the water at the right temperature for the habitat the animals are in, all the way up to more complicated uh, pieces of equipment like automated dosing pumps, which help replenish elements in seawater depleted by um, corals that have used them up as they grow and things like that, because they need a nice stable um, uh, environment for them to be able to grow and survive. And then, as I mentioned before as well, Display design, it's, it's not something that comes up a huge amount, but when it does, it's a nice big project that you can sort of sink your teeth into and, and get your artistic side um, out sort of thing. Um, and then there's obviously the maintenance of the displays as well. It's the less glamorous side of things. There is quite a lot of cleaning, but it all helps with that emotional connection. Uh, if people can be able to see the fish, it definitely helps. So what, what difference can aquarium make? So the, the way I think about it is our primary objective is to uh, reach out to the public and educate them about uh, aquatic animals and their, and their environment. So on, on the very basis, um, we teach them about the animals, their behavior, the morphology, things like that, just the animals that are, are there. And then once that's when you can move out to a broader subject uh, and talk about their environment and ecology. And then once basically people have understood that, you can move on to conservation issues. And when people understand, again, it's a lot easier to get people on board with the issues you're trying to convey and all these things you need to do through your displays. And I'm just gonna move on to a quick example of uh, how we do this. Um, this is our beat plastic pollution campaign that was run in June of 2019, but to coincide, uh, uh, coincide alongside um, uh, World Ocean Day. It was a month long campaign where we basically collected pieces of um, plastic debris and, and plastic waste uh, and introduced it into the, the displays, um, uh, obviously after being cleaned and, out and uh, thoroughly disinfected, et cetera. Uh, and it was just a, basically a, a shop value sort of thing. I don't think it was hugely well, it, I don't think it was advertised sort of thing. So people just came into the aquarium one morning and there was plastic everywhere. Um, this was then paired alongside um, removable decals along each of the displays which um, explained as to the damage that plastic's doing to their individual environment. And this was all sort of headed up um, by the main display, which is our jellyfish display, where we essentially overnight took all the jellyfish off display and um, put them in the tanks behind the scenes and replaced them with um, plastic bags. So people can basically see how similar to jellyfish plastic bags look in the water column and then the signs there um, uh, basically explained about how turtles and things ended up ingesting plastic bags because they see them as a prey item in the water column. Um, overall, we see this as a really successful campaign. A lot of the um, visitor surveys and things like that came away with people feeling really motivated to do something about plastic pollution. And um, we're looking for how they can sort of change that in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, apart from a very few people that were um, very upset that they came to see jellyfish and they didn't get to see them. But that, to me, that's a prime example of someone missing the point. Um, and this also went on to win uh, Museum and Heritage's um, Limited Budget Project Award in 2020 as well. So it's nice to get a little bit of recognition. Um, the other aspect of um, how aquariums basically give back is through the, the uh, opportunity to conduct ex situ research. Um, I'll preface this by saying that aquariums offer a really unique opportunity for um, ex situ, well, for research. Um, basically because they, it's a controlled environment where you can control the parameters of what you're trying to study. So you can take out individual um, influences one at a time and then it basically feeds back to giving you a better understanding as to what causes it or, um, or what affects it basically. The first main thing when it comes to ex situ research is um, agriculture and breeding programs. So for example, if you can breed something like a, an, an, an endangered species and um, you can basically publish those techniques and move that into um, reintroduction schemes and things like that. But also if you can breed something that's a, a heavily fish species, for example, you can help relieve fisheries pressures by developing these techniques. Um, the main uh, thing that comes to mind with our work at the Horniman is Project Coral. Some of you might have heard about this. 
This was an initiative set up in 2012 by my boss, Dr. Jamie Craggs. Um, there was basically a, an idea that he wanted to understand and then replicate um, coral spawning conditions in an aquarium setting. Um, he managed this uh, in the very first in the first year in 2012. And then since then, we've been basically researching to understand the factors that influence coral spawning and also techniques to help improve the um, uh, efficiency in the output of the spawn. So places that are more in the field, uh, sort of in situ conservation efforts can um, use our techniques and help with like out planting and things like that. Uh, one great example of this is with our um, research partners in the, the University of Florida. They, last year, they managed to successfully spawn the pillar coral, which is a, a critically endangered species um, out in the Caribbean. Um, there's less thought to be less than 100 uh, colonies left in the wild, and they managed to spawn this uh, the species with great success um, over there, which is, it gives great um, implications for um, reef restoration efforts for this species in the future. Um, so my recommendations, if you want to do uh, something similar to this, is much like everyone else has said this evening, um, volunteer whenever possible. Um, I mean, uh, if you're at university, if you study marine biology, a lot of these places have aquariums these days. Um, feel free to send an email, go out and talk to them, see if they need any help. Um, and also uh, people that aren't at university, sort of the um, public aquariums as well, they're often not um, hugely well uh, publicized. So or advertised. If you send someone the, the people an email, send the right people an email, they're usually really, really helpful to work, uh, helpful, uh, grateful for the help. Uh, this is how I started out um, in the public aquarium industry anyway. Um, specialize early. I can't stress how much there is to learn about this individual topic and aquarium keeping and and that side of things and all the, the systems, the, the water chemistry principles, et cetera. I mean, I'm still learning to this day. Um, start doing this early because the university courses won't teach you this. Um, but then that leads me on to my third point that um, you can teach yourself essentially. Uh, I know it was mentioned about people wanting to pivot into a marine um, career from something else. There's decades and decades of well, well thought through and um, researched articles that will really help you on your way here and, and like help with interviews and things like that. Just really show that you've gone the extra mile to to research some of these things. And YouTube is a brilliant resource as well. Um, I know there's there's a couple of really well thought out and researched, completely comprehensive um, series on 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 just how to keep aquariums and the animals that you want to keep in them. And so. Um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much me. I want to thank the um, Marine Diaries team for inviting me to talk and everyone for listening. And um, if you've got any questions, um, shoot them my way. Cheers. Perfect. Thank you, Matt. Um, if you, perfect. So once again, if anyone has any questions, you can raise your hands and we'll unmute you. And we also have the doc. Um, I'm going to start off by asking a question from the doc, Matt. And this is yeah. from Ella. And she says, I have an interview next week to work as a diver in an aquarium. Do you have yeah. any tips for me? Um, uh, I'll, I'll put this out here first. I've never done sort of like the commercial diving sort of thing, the large scale scuba diving in aquariums. Um, but what helped me when with the, with the interviews that I've done before is basically showing my previous, showing like the, the previous sort of um, work that I've done uh, outside of the aquariums and things like that, as well as sort of researching the um, sort of like the, the MO sort of thing of the individual aquarium. A lot of aquariums vary from aquarium to aquarium, what their sort of goal is. So like the Horneman is a very family-based organization. So they want to see that you can um, uh, reach out to sort of family, like people of all ages sort of thing, um, and just sort of like cater um, your answers to that sort of thing. Um, uh, and then, uh, like, I don't know about other ones, but other ones might be more information based. So yeah, just, just do, do a bit of research before and, and, uh, and just show what you're doing. A lot of these places require really, really high sort of diving qualifications. So if you have the, the places, the qualifications, um, required to do that, I'm sure you've done a bit of diving elsewhere, just show that you're passionate about that and safety and, 
and along the education side of things as well, every aquarium wants to educate people. So. Perfect. Thanks, Matt. Another right. question I have from the document is what made you look for museums for marine conservation work? Um, so it was it was it was through my volunteering to be honest. I, I initially set out with my so you probably see from the qualification side of things. I, I set out and to do the research um, sort of lifestyle. You know the, the tropical tropical beach, tropical island, marine biologist. And then I ended up going out there for a, for a month and absolutely hated it. Um, that was before I did my just before I did my masters. And I sort of went into my master's with just like a really open mind. And one, one day I got an email through um, saying that there's volunteering opportunities going at the Horniman Museum. And um, basically sent an email, got on a train and started working there. And that's where I fell in love sort of thing with the, um, with the, the public aquarium side of things. It was, it was everything that I wanted to, to sort of do from a research standard, but it seemed a lot more direct. Like we've mentioned uh, previously this evening about um, there being a lack of communication between science and uh, and the sort of general public, and I feel like um, uh, museums and aquariums are, are a brilliant way to do that. Um, so that's basically I pivoted from there and, and went down the public side of things, and just re remembered to try and put as much um, science into what I do as possible. It's, it's very easy to sort of fall into the "who oh, is a pretty fish" sort of thing. Um, but, uh, yeah, just, yeah. <laughs> it just, just happened to be, yeah. Um, another question that I was also kind of interested in that someone asked um, was if I'd like to get into aquarium work, but there aren't any junior slash assistant aquarist positions, how would you advise I proceed? Should I begin with a desk job and go from there? Or what qualifications would you look for? Um, to be honest, there's, there's lots of different sort of aquarium branches. Um, if you, if it's physically like the, there is one, I know a lot of people that have sort of started on the, on the sort of like visitor interaction side of things, or like you say, in, in the retail side, and um, basically just sat in those until positions became available and obviously the new contacts and, and made themselves sort of available at that time. Um, but there's lots of other sort of things as well. Um, sort of like looking for like the marine hobby side of things. Um, that's where I learned a lot of my sort of coral knowledge, working in a, a marine aquarium store, sort of like working with corals in and out, getting shipments of corals once, twice a week sort of thing. And it just really helps with that sort of thing. So if, if you look at that as a stepping stone as such, maybe um, as, as um, sort of like, oh, work in the hobby side of things, then you can scale up in a few years when positions are available. That's uh, probably a good way of doing it. Um, but yeah, don't don't write off the the hobby side of things because it's not professionals, which is a lot of good information to to learn there. Great, thanks, Matt. Um, we have a question here that says, um, "Thanks loads for sharing that. You mentioned some great, well-researched YouTube channels on keeping aquariums. Would you mm -hmm. be up for sharing those here?" Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, what you've been learning from. Sorry, what was that second part? They just said it would be great to uh, hear what you recommend learning from. So if you could share yeah, your resources. Uh, I can throw some um, links out or I can send you the, the links afterwards, but the ones that come to mind, um, BRS TV, um, they're a brilliant YouTube channel that they're, they're a wholesale business. They, they sell a lot of aquarium products. So it's something you've got to keep in mind with um, when, when you're watching their things. They do a, a lot of selling, but they're really comprehensive and broad about it. And seem to be really upfront about what everything on the market and things like that. That's more to do with the, the sort of actual aquarium system design and stuff like that. Um, a channel called Tidal Gardens has a brilliant um, profile series, um, uh, basically where they go through a really deep dive on individual coral families, and um, uh, basically 20, 30 minute videos on one family sort of thing. They cover every aspect sort of thing. Um, and there's a few others as well, but I can't, the names aren't coming to mind. So I'll, I'll send some links through and um, maybe we can distribute it afterwards. Yeah, we'll make sure to email any useful links um, or put them in the, in the document and we'll send it around to everyone with the recording as well. So 
don't worry about trying to save everything from the chat. We'll make sure that you will receive all of the information. Okay, cool. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Matt. Um, I think I want to go get myself an aquarium now and start learning how to take care of fish. And it also sounds like you're a bit of a landscape designer for aquariums too, with being an aquarist, which I didn't realize that was part it, of it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really, it goes overlooked, but um, yeah, it's really important. Oh, great. Well, thank you so much. Um, I think this wraps up our session. Um, and I'd like to say thank you to all our panelists. And I know we've had a lot of questions from the audience and I'd like to put one more question out maybe to each one of you on our panel, if you wouldn't mind in conclusion, kind of giving your answer to this and saying a concluding remark, but everyone's kind of wondering how to get into marine careers. And we have a lot of students as well um, that have joined us. And I think, what everyone would like to know and what would be the best concluding question is, could you recommend, if you were re reviewing a resume or a cover letter, what is one skill or phrase that you would look for in that resume or cover letter that would make you hire that person for your field? So I'll give you a moment to think about it as I thank our audience for joining and uh, we'll send around a recording and all the links after this as well. Um, so stay tuned for that and always feel free to reach out with any questions at media at the marine diaries.com. So maybe Josh, would you like to start? Sure. Um, that's a good question. Um, I would suggest if I was looking at someone's resume, I would be looking for, you know, honestly, the resume is a great thing. It's honestly the interview. So in a resume, I'd look for experience. I don't look at your academia for personally, I wouldn't look at if you had A pluses or if you had C pluses. Um, I would look at what you've done in your career, what you what you want to do, your aspirations, your goals. I think of putting a nice note about what, you know, what interests you. Um, and when you get into the interview, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of it, what is important is how personable you are and how you can work together as a team. Honestly, I've worked with a lot of people, some of them, some of the most brilliant people I've ever met. And honestly, I wouldn't have hired them. Um, I, I personally work with people that have great personalities and love what they do and are very enthusiastic. And those are the people that really inspire me. And hopefully, yeah, I think those are the people I'd go for too as well. I'm looking at a resume and an interview. Perfect. Thanks, Josh. Um, Yan, do you want to go next? <laughs> yes, I was thinking. Uh, I hope that I, I came last, but um, it's a complicated question, I think, um, because I uh, judge more the people during interviews, as Josh said, because you, um, I mean, uh, I trust the competencies of the person, and everybody is here to learn. But it's a question of personality. Uh, usually, I mean, it's really rare that you actually walk on your own all the time. And usually you're part of a team. So you're trying to build the team as complementary as possible. But if I would answer properly the question, I would say when I read a resume or a cover letter, uh, it needs to answer my needs. So if I state that I need that competencies or I mean teamwork or I don't know these core competencies etc. I need the people to emphasize on this. When when the people they say, I mean when the recruiter or at school they say you need to personalize your cover letter. I mean don't rewrite everything, but look at what exactly what they expect from you. What are the missions that they're looking for? and what kind of profile they want. Um, and you take like all the core words, the keywords, and you build, I mean, you create like a small paragraphs and you answer their needs. So when they read it through, they will see first of all what they want to see. So then you gain like, a, I don't know, few places on the, in the competition list, and then they will go into the details. But and then it's your turn. It's your turn to play during the interview. <laughs> so be yourself. Perfect. Thanks, Yan. So you look for the hard skills 
All right, Matt, what about you? Um, for the sort of like the aquarium industry specifically, it'd be really important to sort of convey that you, you sort of care about the, the, the aquariums and the education sort of um, potential that it has. There's nothing worse than someone wanting to be a, a field marine biologist and have them sat in a, an aquarium basically. So just sort of passion for the field basically, make sure that comes across as well as your, your previous experience and things like that. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, I hope everyone learned a lot from this workshop. And thank you, um, Josh, Matt, and Yan for your time, and Lizzie, even though she's not on the call, for um, putting together all this information for us. Um, I think we got a ton of questions and lots of engagement. So that was great to see. And thank you so much for being here. Um, I'll pass it off to Rebecca for a final concluding remark. Hi everyone, and yeah, just to reiterate what Ali was saying, um, it's been so fantastic to hear from everyone and to see you all kind of, you know, asking questions and responding to each other as well and offering each other advice, which is really, really lovely. Um, I've left a couple of slides um, in the document where you can add your own top tips um, and you can also add your social links if you want to um, you know, connect with people after this call, just leave one of your um, social profiles, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever. Um, if we run out of slides, just copy and paste one and we'll try and keep an eye on it. Um, and there's also a further slide at the end, which just has some resources. Um, so if you're still looking to find out about different marine careers other than the ones um, we've obviously talked about tonight, we do have an interview series with different marine professionals um, called Into the Industry. It's on our website under the blog section. Um, so we've interviewed people from all different types of ocean careers, um, very similar kind of format as we've done tonight. You can find out more about what it, what it involves and, and what kind of you would be doing if you followed that career. Um, and I've also left some links to um, Wise Ocean's resources, um, which is a great great organization um, and yeah I just wanted to say as well thank you to, to all the panelists um, for joining and to Rita and Lewis um, doing all of the technical stuff in the background um, and thank you all for, for listening. We will um, try and send all of your unanswered questions um, to the panelists um, obviously they are very busy so um, we'll, we'll try and get as many answers as, as possible um, but as, as well, that their social links are um, in the document. So if you want to drop them a DM, um, you can do that as well. And I hope everyone found this um, really useful. And um, hopefully we'll be doing more of these in the future. So uh, we'll, we'll see you there. Thanks so much, guys. <laughs>